you are going to die. Now, I think you probably already know this, but it's interesting how that statement makes people pretty uncomfortable. You are going to die. And you might be here thinking like, okay, I know, but you don't have to rub my face in it, but I'm going to rub your face in it. And not only am I going to rub your face in it, I'm going to ask you to sit with this truth and with this reality, not only here tonight, but throughout the entire season of Lent. You are going to die. Dwell on that. Sit with it. Hold it. Do something like this. Imagine your own aged, diseased, and mortally wounded body. Remind yourself regularly that you too, like all flesh, will one day leave behind your body and all else. And that it will happen on a day very much like this one, maybe in a place, if you are fortunate, like the place where you are in this very moment. With or without the presence of other people who you are with now, imagine death as ever present, accompanying you everywhere, just out of sight behind your left shoulder. Imagine and remember, you are going to die. This is actually the insistence of Ash Wednesday, which is the gateway to the season that we call Lent. Now, oftentimes when we come to Ash Wednesday, if you've ever been a part of it, we kind of use more poetic language that we take out of the pages of Scripture from a poem that we find there. And it's a reference to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, in which we are told this, the land the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. We learn later in Genesis chapter 2 that God formed woman from the side of man, and we learn that God invited them to work the ground, to take care of it, to co-create with him. And we also know that not long after, as the story goes, they ate from a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate the fruit that they were told not to eat from, and that action brought consequences. And the consequences we learn are these in Genesis chapter 3. It says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, if you choose to receive ashes on your head tonight, these will be the words that are spoken over you. From dust you have come, to dust you will return. Now, these words are really poetic, but let's not mince words. These words are also pretty straightforward. These words are saying this, you are going to die. That's what they mean. And for those of us who grew up in and around religion, those of us who grew up in and around Christianity, these words can be for us, from dust you have come to dust you return, they can be kind of ritual. Or they can fall a little bit poetic and maybe allow us to distance ourselves from the hard and fast truth of what they are saying. But what we need to remember is that for the people who first heard these words when they existed only in oral form, from dust you've come to dust you will return, they lived their existence much closer to the earth than we live ours now. They were constantly reminded what the dust of the ground was, and they knew that at some point they would go back to it. But today in our modern world, we live largely disconnected lives from the earth, from the dust of the ground from which we have come. And it's easy for us to actually forget the reality that you are going to die. It's fascinating when you look at the world in which we live now, most people in the Western modern context spend more time indoors, insulated from the outdoors. Our education no longer comes from the earth, but now our education comes from nonstop news sources where we swallow the opinions of newscasters and journalists and allow it to inform the way that we think about others, think about issues, think about ourselves, think about politics. We used to connect with one another flesh on flesh, face to face, sharing the same air and the same breath. Now we believe that real connection can actually happen on social media or over text. In so many ways, we've distanced ourselves from the earth, 
from which we have come. And it becomes very easy for us to forget, you are going to die. We are going to die. It's fascinating. We consider ourselves the the most advanced civilization ever in the history of the world. But I think we need to ask ourselves a question, what do we mean by advanced? I mean, really, we're the most advanced society in the world? When we spend, as a country, more money on military and defense than the next 10 nations combined, and yet no matter how much we spend, we're still unable to find any real security within our own hearts. I mean, we have all kinds of technology now. We can connect in an instant with people all the way on the other side of the globe, but we have an epidemic of loneliness. We can do more things at once faster than ever before, and we don't have any time. When it comes to medicine, I mean, the advances are unbelievable, and yet we still have not learned how to keep anxiety at bay in our hearts, in our bodies, and in our minds. And death? We don't like to talk about death. We don't even like to talk about getting old. I mean, Age really, really scares us. As a culture, what we've come to celebrate in value more than anything else is youth. And so we cut ourselves open and we insert fake plastic parts onto our bodies. We cut our faces up and stretch our skin. We dye the gray away. By the way, it hasn't always been like this. You see, the idea of youth being the thing that we should actually pursue began decades ago when marketers figured out that if they actually targeted young people in their marketing, corporations would get them to be consumers at a younger age and it would benefit their bottom line. Now, if you're here and you're a young person, this is not a slight on you or a critique on you. You're young, that's okay. But we used to live in a a world in which young people really actually wanted to hear from their elders. And now we've come to value youth so much because of our fear of death and our disconnection from anything else that now elders are taking their cues from youth. And where has all of this gotten us? To an adolescent culture where the political leaders in our country act more like children than adults. Where we're easily offended by any slight that anybody happens to give where we refuse to look within our own selves and own the ways that we have injured people, how we have contributed to the problems that exist in our world because everything is their fault. This is the world that we've chosen to live in. And we've forgotten the essential truth that you are going to die. You see, we've ceased taking our cues and we've ceased learning and ceased uh, understanding the rhythms of the natural world and instead we've simply given ourselves wholly over, almost unconsciously, to the rhythms of our cultural world which says more is better, bigger is better, faster is better, power is better. We've ignored the natural world that even just by its very existence teaches us you're going to die. And by the way, this is the constant invitation of Jesus. Jesus is actually always inviting us to die. Jesus says things like, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Jesus' most frequent invitation is follow me. Oh, and by that I mean pick up your cross. Come and die with me. We struggle to hear that so much. We struggle to hear this invitation of Jesus so deeply. And here's the saddest part of it. This invitation, this reality is actually good news. And I say it's good news because in the Jesus story, which is the story that epitomizes what it means to be fully human, in the Jesus story, which is our story, your story and my story, death does not have the final word. In the Jesus story, death is the prelude to life. In the Jesus story, the tomb is something that is filled with expectation. It's a symbol of promise. It's it's asking us, what do you think will come next? And we get our answer in six and a half weeks. Resurrection, transformation, that's what comes next. This is good news that you are going to die. 
And I believe that the seeds of this reality and, and the longing for this death are actually planted deep within us, much actually like the seeds are planted in the body of a caterpillar. And we all know caterpillars are gross and then they turn into butterflies, which are gross with nice wings. But what's interesting is that in the body of a caterpillar, they have something that's called the imaginal buds. What they are, they're seeds within the body of a caterpillar that are the very thing that lead it to weave its cocoon. Now, while it's a caterpillar, the immune system of the caterpillar attempts to attack these imaginal buds to kill them because they know it's a danger to the life of the caterpillar, but eventually the imaginal buds win and the caterpillar weaves its own portal of death for itself. And it is in that place that it becomes transformed. We are invited to the same thing. We are invited to recognize the seeds that are planted within us to hear the invitation to come and to die, to pick up our cross, to fall off the stalk of wheat so that we don't remain only a single seed. And just like the immune system of a caterpillar, quite frankly, our egos and our self-preservation does everything it can to attack those seeds and say, no, 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 no. But what we come to each season on Ash Wednesday in every Lent is the reality that you are going to die. Now, it's your choice as to whether you die before you die. Because the sad reality is most people face death for the first time when they take their last breath. And so the question I want to ask is not just for tonight, but for us to consider and to contemplate and to hold during this season of Lent is this. What in my life needs to die? What in my life needs to die? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a relationship you have that you're using only to feed yourself. Maybe it's a relationship you have that's in some ways asking too much of you and you're giving yourself away and every time you do, something in you is saying, stop it, but you can't. Maybe that's what needs to die. What in my life needs to die? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's an addiction to your phone. Maybe it's an addiction to a substance. Maybe it's an addiction to social media or to television. Whatever it is that's numbing you out and keeping you away from the real pain that you're afraid to actually address in your life. What in your life needs to die? Maybe it's a way of being in this world. Maybe it's a way that you've chosen to show up because you know if you act this way or show up this way or you simply be this way, you receive praise from people and it feeds your ego, but beneath all of that is the real you. And something in you is longing to show the world that. Maybe your way of being is what needs to die. Maybe it's your upside-down priorities that you walk around and say, my friends are the most important thing in my life or my partner's the most important thing in my life or my family's the most important thing in your life. But let's be honest, it's actually money and prestige and status because that's what you give most of your time and attention to. Maybe what needs to die are our upside down priorities. You see, Lent says to us, what in your life needs to die? Not just so we can kill it off, but so that something new can be born, so that something new can resurrect, so that new life can grow in a place where death once reigned. What in your life needs to die? And we need people who are willing to ask this question, and we need people that are willing to hold the reality that we are going to die. And here's why I say this. Because when we are willing to hold the reality that we are going to die gradually, you will come to live in the light of death. Not morbidly, but with an increasingly joyful appreciation for this moment and your presence in it. 
You will cling less and less to who you are and how you are and become more attuned to your destiny with allegiance to neither your social past nor the current accommodations of your personality. One day you will find you are not so attached to your life being just one certain way. By confronting the truths held by death, we are able to gradually relinquish our illusion of immortality and find ourselves with a new hope for the world. You are going to die. And what our world needs now more than ever is not the right candidate, is not the right political party flipping any particular seat in any particular house in any particular government. What our world needs more than ever right now are men and women, brothers and sisters, children of God who are willing to break themselves open and pour themselves out for the sake of this earth and for the sake of this world and for the sake of its global citizens so that a new hope and a new life can be born. You are going to die. Lent gives us an opportunity to reflect on what in us needs to die so that maybe we can undergo death before we breathe our last. Let's pray together. God, we're preparing ourselves. We're preparing ourselves to remember the death crucifixion of Jesus. That in the distance we see that cross and we know you're inviting us to participate in that death. We know that you're reminding us even now, this is what awaits us should we choose to follow Jesus, that he for us shows us what we are invited to undergo in our lives, to undergo the death. Tonight we are confronted with the stark reality, we are going to die. But God, you and your grace say to us, yeah, but you can die before you die. And in dying before you die, you find new life. We know that this is what the world needs. We've tried power. We've tried winning. We've tried lording it over. And we confess that we're in a difficult spot. So would you create in us, craft in us, make in us together hearts that are willing to be broken open, poured out, people who are willing to die in imitation of Jesus for the sake of this world. We thank you for this season. We ask that you would give us a vision for what it is in our lives that needs to die. Remind us that whatever we might be resisting the most right now might actually be the very thing you're calling us to. So give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, and give us courage to act. We pray these things together in the strong name of our Savior Jesus and all the children of God said.